Hello, everyone, and welcome to Steps in Getting the Cruise Industry Up and Running, a Sea Trade Cruise broadcast by Informa Markets, sponsored by Wärtsilä. I'm Ann Kalosh, and I'll be your moderator today. And I'm thrilled to say that we have more than 600 people registered from around the world for this webcast. So welcome to everyone who's joining us. A few quick announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. Toward the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you are experiencing any technical problems, click the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type into the Q&A area, and we will be glad to offer you one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now, on to the panel, steps in getting the cruise industry up and running. Joining me today are Louis Ahamil, President and CEO of Bermeo Ahamil & Partners, one of the world's leading cruise port <laughs> firms. Admiral Brian Salerno, Senior Vice President, Maritime Policy, Cruise Lines International Association. And Brian is a key player in facilitating the cruise industry's response to COVID-19. Jürgen Strandberg, Director, Agile Business Development, Wärtsilä Voyage Solutions. Wärtsilä, we all know, a key pro propulsion supplier, now branching into medical technology to help the cruise industry get up and running. So that will be very interesting to hear about. To start, given that today is the International Day of the Seafarer, and we know that many tens of thousands of cruise ship crew are still stuck out at sea, I'd like to ask Brian Salerno to begin by saying a few words. Brian? Thank you, Anne, and good morning to everybody on the call. And I really appreciate you starting off with the acknowledgement of the Day of the Seafarer. We have about 225,000 seafarers that make it possible for our industry to operate. And of course, they're part of a broader maritime community of millions of seafarers around the world. The whole purpose of the Day of the Seafarer this year is to acknowledge that these seafarers are key workers and they're entitled to dignity and respect. Sadly, because of COVID, we have many of examples this year of seafarers not being treated the way they are entitled to be treated. Examples of where the, the Maritime Labor Convention has not been honored in terms of the ability to repatriate seafarers to their homes, the ability of ships to conduct crew transfers, and so forth. This has created an enormous burden on the industry, but most especially on the seafarers involved. So I ask you to keep them in mind. Uh, we do have seafarers that are still on idled cruise ships. Uh, our industry is doing everything we can to take care of them and make them comfortable. But this, is, this has been an extremely difficult year. Uh, and so again, thank you, Anne, for, for acknowledging uh, this special day uh, where we, we really need to keep their their welfare foremost in our minds. Thank you very much, Brian. Now, let's turn to the million dollar question, the million euro question, the million pound question, the million kroner question. When cruise lines may be able to sail again? Brian, CLIA just extended its no sale order to um, from US ports to September 15th. Do you have any indication about the CDC's timeline? Well, nothing specific, Anne. Um, however, in our most recent discussion with the CDC, they were really not interested in opening discussions on resumption. Um, their focus still remains on the current requirements under the, the no-sale order. 
so our takeaway from that discussion was CDC does not envision resumption in the short term. So our, our voluntary extension acknowledges that, you know, conditions are just not right yet, you know, within the U.S. to resume sailing that may be different elsewhere. But in the U.S., it may take a, some additional time. But this will give us, our, our voluntary extension will give us some additional time to work through many of the issues with the CDC and ultimately reaching a point where they're comfortable with the resumption of crews after September 15th. Well, CDC's quarantine chief has said cruise lines face a Herculean task in protecting travelers from COVID-19 with cruise ship infection rates equal to those in prisons, meat packing plants, and nursing homes. Brian, if that's the way CDC views cruise ships, what's their motivation to work with the industry? Isn't cruising just a problem for the CDC? Uh, well, first of all, let me um, say that I, I would dispute the characterization of the cruise industry as being as uh, problematic as the CDC has portrayed it. Uh, if, if you just look at the numbers, um, the number of people who have been infected on cruise ships, you know, the global number, uh, as in relationship to the number of people infected throughout the U.S., it's a fraction of a percent. Uh, likewise with fatalities. Now, obviously, we don't want any fatalities, but it's still, it's very, very small compared to the total. If you even consider some of the work done by uh, Dr. Uh, Bromage up at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, Mass. Uh, he looked at you know, outbreaks of COVID across multiple venues and found that cruise ship outbreaks don't even land in the in the top 50 of environments where people get sick. So I, again, I dispute the, the characterization of cruise as being particularly high risk. I think uh, if you look at it objectively. Um, you come away with a very different conclusion. Um, we do have a responsibility to take care of our passengers and our crew. We acknowledge that. In fact, we embrace that. And our, our feeling is that when cruising does resume, people will see that we have put measures in place that uh, shows that we are taking that responsibility very, very seriously. Tell us about the relationship between the cruise industry and CDC. Is there an actual regular working relationship with the quarantine division? Well, we've always had a very positive relationship with the CDC, and in particular with uh, the vessel sanitation program. And our hope is to continue that relationship. It's clearly come under some stress during COVID. Uh, I don't think that is attributable to any ill will, uh, if anything. You know, I think it's a, a, a function of the CDC being under enormous stress dealing with, with a national health emergency. They have a tough job to do, and, and we respect that. But we also believe at the same time that in order to protect passengers and crew, that the best way to do that is for us to engage in regular, meaningful, direct communication. So it's very clear what their, their goals are and that we can offer maybe better ways to achieve those goals, you know, to, uh, to achieve what we, we mutually uh, are hoping to accomplish. Is CDC going to take a prescriptive approach and give you specific things that you have to follow? Well, we can only speculate at this time. Uh, CDC has not signaled its intentions regarding resumption. However, we can assume that many of the requirements that they have put in place under the no-sale order will carry forward when cruising resumes, you know, such things as enhanced medical care, you know, beyond what is already required for CLIA members. You know, our, our members already agreed to follow the guidelines of the American College of Emergency Physicians. We have doctors on board. We have nurses. Uh, we have medical facilities that, that meet certain high standards. Uh, but that would be enhanced. Uh, the, we would also anticipate enhanced logistical arrangements to help manage any cases that do emerge on board a ship, you know, if anyone who falls ill, especially if they need to be evacuated. Uh, you know, so far, you know, CDC has not relied on the normal regulatory process. You know, aside from publishing the no-sale order in the Federal Register, you know, their guidance and requirements have been communicated by, by website. 
And although that's expedient, it does create some difficulties in interpreting their intentions, you know, when that's done without any prior discussion. So we're, we're hopeful, we keep pressing for more meaningful dialogue so that we, as we do approach resumption, we can do so in a coordinated fashion. Okay, well, so far we've focused on the U.S. What is happening with authorities in other parts of the world? Well, uh, there are discussions uh, with governments um, around the world. Uh, CLIA does have you know, offices in Brussels, in, in Brazil, in Australia, uh, in Canada. And in each of those places, governments are very interested in what the industry is planning to do uh, in preparation for resumption. Different, different parts of the world are proceeding at different paces. I would say Europe is uh, much further ahead than the United States. There's a lot of dialogue currently taking place with um, European healthy gateways um, and with the European Maritime Safety Agency, looking at maritime authorities, uh, to really explore the nature of protocols that uh, would be applied across the industry. So. Um, that's a work in progress, uh, but the fact that they're having those discussions with uh, EU Healthy Gateways um, is encouraging. Uh, and it, again, it's further along than we are in the U.S. How about in Asia? Uh, a CLIA does not have a presence in Asia, but individual cruise lines uh, who do operate there uh, have been engaging uh, in places such as Singapore uh, and Hong Kong. Uh, in you know, the broader Pacific region, um, Australia and Oceania, our office there has been in touch with uh, the health ministry in Australia. Um, there are some lingering legal issues in Australia, you know, from the, the early days of COVID. I think we're going to have to work our way through those before we see resumption there. I would characterize Australia and New Zealand being somewhat analogous to the situation in the United States in terms of where we stand on resumption. Okay, well, just to quickly recap, um, we know that river cruises are starting in Europe. Uh, we have seen ocean cruises beginning just a few days ago on the coast of Norway and between Norway and Denmark. Ocean cruises expected to be able to begin soon from France and Germany. Iceland and Svalbard are opening for expedition cruises. So far, Spain is blocking cruise ships, but allowing ferries. And across the globe in French Polynesia, uh, that area is opening to all international travelers in mid-July, and cruises will be involved. Australia may allow coastal cruising by domestic lines, and there is a campaign uh, talking about getting small ships to be able to sail between the, in the Tasman between New Zealand and Australia. But as, as Brian said, um, we'll have to wait and see what happens uh, from the health authorities' perspective on that. So, Jurgen, is there anything that you would like to add about cruising restarting from Europe, given that you are based there? Uh, so, we also see a limited activity in the Baltic in a similar pattern where you load only basically one group of this common nationality so that the one set of rules uh, apply. We see across Europe that the COVID restrictions are done on a national basis uh, rather than European level. And that means that every country has different rules. And with that, we see that the Baltic operators are trying to get like a, a group of Finnish people to go on uh, on cruises using only the Finnish population and the same for Swedes, uh, but they are kept separate. So uh, all in that, just not to have the ships idle, I would I would expect, but but at least having a break even rather than um, hot layup with uh, with loss. Okay, thank you. Now, as far as cruising restarting from U.S. ports, and I'd like to bring Lewis into the discussion here as well, and, and Brian again, um, where do you see the earliest possibilities, apart from the domestic and coastal river cruising that we're seeing beginning now in the U.S.? Would you like Lewis to go first, or me? 
Who's who's jumping to answer that question? <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. And I'll, I'll okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have, I'm happy to start. Well, I, again, the uh, CDC no sale order applies throughout the United States. So any sh it applies to any ship that can carry 250 persons or more. So that persons includes crew. So where we'll see cruising and begin in the U.S., uh, it would be you know fairly small cruise ships uh, that would be you know eligible as long as the no sale order remains in place. Our extension, our voluntary industry extension, again applies to the same ships that the no sale order applies to. So it wouldn't include the smaller ships. So we may see some um, initial activity there. You know, river cruising. Uh, there's some discussion potentially of cruising in Alaska, um, but. Uh, again, it's all very limited, uh, given the, the current constraints. Mm -hmm. Lewis? Well, from, you know, from a practical perspective, we know it's got to occur within the windows that cruise lines have the ability to do that uh, in terms of their financial resources and when they have to do it, uh, and that we're ready to take it. So, our, you know, it, it, no more than a crystal ball always told us that it would be um, right around October or so that we would begin to see uh, that we'd be ready to uh, to accept cruises on a limited basis and then ramping up so that at the start of the next year and particularly the winter season of 2021 that uh, you could be in a uh, in back to uh, not a hundred percent but but a fairly good capacity of the system so there has been discussion about the possibility of starting cruises from South Florida ports to the Bahamas private islands, given that all of the operators, many of the operators have their own private islands, and that would be a way to control the shoreside experience. Does that sound like a, fe a feasible uh, opening to you, gentlemen? I, I thought that that would be a very logical step in that you can go from a controlled environment to another controlled environment. Clearly, um, you know, it's about controlling the entire journey from the passenger leaving home, getting on the ship, going to a destination and returning. Um, it would probably make a lot of sense uh, to be able to do that uh, or controlled environments where they can go. And uh, it's not just you know, it's off in the Caribbean that there's some of these islands. There, there's a few places that uh, that have that kind of control environment. And I would add that I, I think it it fits a pattern that we'll see globally. That when cruising resumes, you know, it's not going to get back to 100 percent to where it was before. You know, operations were suspended. It's going to be gradual. It's going to be phased. And part of that, and is along the lines you described before, where we're already starting to see some resumption of activity, uh, tends to be limited duration cruises, uh, very limited itineraries. If there if there's any shore excursions at all, you know, some may just be cruises to nowhere, but certainly cruises to private islands would fit that pattern. Uh, and, and a number of cruise lines have the ability to do that. And as Lewis pointed out, it's it's a way to control uh, the environment. You know, as this proceeds in the future and itineraries are are built out, you know, it presumes a lot of dialogue with those ports and destinations and terminals in order to preserve uh, the level of protection um, that are built into the cruise lines protocols. You know, to protect people and crew. You know, so we, we want to make sure that there's parity, you know, wherever a cruise ship ends up going. And that's going to take a little bit of time. But there are there are ways to start this process that, uh, we, you know, just described that will get people used to cruising again. And, and this is very important. It will start building confidence among government officials and among the cruising public that the industry has uh, robust procedures in place to to protect their health. Well, thank you, Brian. That destination aspect is very important, and we're going to delve into that quite a bit in just a minute. Before we talk more about the ports and destinations, I would like to ask you about the actual onboard experience on the ship. How is cruising going to change? How is the cruise experience going to change going forward? Well, I think people will see uh, quite a few 
differences when they go on board a ship. Um, you know, social distancing will will be a factor. Um, you know, which may be apparent in you know the occupancy levels of of onboard restaurants and theaters and gyms. Uh, buffets may be managed differently. You know, f for example, food may be served by a staff member rather than you know a self serve uh, type of arrangement. So that reduces the number of you know high touch surfaces, utensils, and so forth. I think technology may also play a role. You know, a number of cruise lines are are looking at uh, apps that might be you know able to be loaded on somebody's uh, smartphone that might enable contactless room entry for example um, and you know they're looking at technology that might assist with onboard contact tracing so if somebody does develop symptoms it might be easier to tell who might have been in close proximity to that person so there's a there's a number of um, ways you know and I can't even list them all you know, in, a, in a short period of time where cruising will look different but there's also a tremendous amount of effort being placed on it. You know, it has to still be a fun experience. So we're trying to blend uh, those two requirements, you know, as we build out protocols for, for resumption. And Brian, could you talk a bit about how cruising may be different for the crew? Will there be social distancing and crew quarters and so forth? Well, absolutely. Uh, we have to protect the, the health of the crew. Um, be, you know, for obvious reasons, uh, the, uh, particularly you know those that are interacting with passengers, but really every crew member, because um, you know any type of an illness can spread. So, you'll the crew members will experience similar types of um, testing uh, that you know would be common and 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 you know many forms of transportation and and for even for cruise passengers, uh, temperature checks. Uh, uh, health checks. There may be limitations on transfers between ships, just to kind of limit, you know, any potential for, um, you know, carrying, you know, a virus. Uh, but the, and crew will be trained. They'll be trained in identifying symptoms. They'll be um, trained in, you know, uh, uh, and sanitation procedures. Uh, any number of ways that uh, their experience will be a little bit different, but also more protective. Of the way they conduct their their routine uh, duties on board. Of all of the things that the cruise lines are dealing with in terms of onboard changes, which are the most challenging? Um, I th I think what will be the most challenging will be the you know the coordination uh, with the the shore interface. Um, just like we were talking about a little while ago. I mean, there has to be very strong coordination with ports and terminals. Um, it, it'll start even when passengers arrive at the terminals. You know, do we start looking at staggered arrival times? You know, it's still an open question as to whether there'll be, you know, what the screening would look like, you know, for passengers before they embark. And if there is screening, you know, do we need to, you know, earmark a certain portion of terminals, you know, for that purpose? You know, how do we conduct social distancing, disinfecting procedures, and so forth? Shore excursions is another, I think, particularly difficult nut to crack. Uh, one of the reasons people take cruises is they want to visit destinations. They want to see the sites. Uh, and that's obviously something the cruise industry wants to provide. So how do we gain assurance that shore excursion providers are following local health authority restrictions, that the, again, proper social distancing, personal protective equipment, sanitation, uh, and so forth. So these are very detailed discussions that have to take place. Uh, I think they will be uh, particularly challenging. Well, that's a perfect lead in to talking about the ports. And Lewis, I'm going to turn to you now and ask, what are the ports responsibilities during the COVID-19 period? Well, it's a really interesting question, and, and we've been trying to um, dwell on that issue because it, this has never been, in modern times, this has never been an issue for ports dealing with health uh, aspects of the customer. And so finding legal grounds and finding reasons and, and, and how who is responsible, I think that's still an unanswered question in many places. Um, which is sort of interesting because that used to be one of the primary functions of most ports before the jet era, because that was that's how 
ships would uh, travel people, we would travel ships, and one of the main importance was public health facilities at ports. Uh, so in a way, we're going back to that. Um, so uh, number one uh, is that ports have to come to the realization that they have a huge role, that it is not just about cleaning the terminal, uh, providing hand washers, um, and uh, and making sure that everything is spick and span. I think there's going to be uh, more responsibilities. And what's what will be really uh, more, uh, I think, interesting is that most people will associate that with the embarkation process. And yet, uh, we strongly feel that it's going to be equally, if not important, on the disembarkation process in order to gain the, the confidence of communities where ships disembark. So people are much interested of having a healthy environment for the passenger to go on the ship. You know, the best way to prevent the spread on the ship is not to let it in in the first place. So if you put your resources there and maintain the ships clean, your outcome is gonna be 100% better. And now you get to the disembark side in which it cannot just be walk through and go to the outside. Um, and that's where, at the end, that's where we might end up. And right now in United States ports, that role, the only role that is being uh, enforced is basically a customs and border protection role, not a health, not a public health role. So uh, that is gonna be a major aspect, which the first is who is responsible for that role, who's gonna provide it, and, and then how is it gonna be executed? So what should ports be doing right now to prepare for all of these things? Well, first, I think that a couple of things. One, obviously, they need to come to terms uh, whether or not this is a role they're comfortable. Many ports operate a lot very different. Some ports are landlord ports. Some ports actually operate the terminals. Some ports lease out the terminals. Um, and, and they have to make a determination of what is going to be provided, not based on what CDC says, not based on the cruise lines, on the disembark is what's based on what the community is looking for. And that will go such a long way in helping uh, the cruise industry return to that city. So if the port takes a leadership position in saying, these are the steps we're taking at our port to protect you city, uh, that is going to go. The, that is going to go so big. So ports need to do that, and then figure out who is responsible, and then how to execute it. So is it a model like security, in that in which most ports there is a there is a general um, a plan, uh, the security plan, which is then uh, approved by an agency, in this case the Coast Guard, and then executed in most ports either by private contractors. And in some cases, limited cases, the port itself. And is that the model that you go forward? And that's a, that's a real possibility because nobody has the resources to really put uh, the facilities in to do this. So talk a bit about what's happening in several Alaska ports, because I believe you are involved up there in helping them to determine protocols. So... Uh, we've had these discussions in many different regions uh, of, of the cruise region. And, and, and the first question we had, uh, the, the first reaction by ports is that they're waiting for the cruise lines or CDC or CLIA to provide these guidelines. And as you can see, those guidelines are not forthcoming rather quickly enough. So if we go on a, a linear thinking model in that you wait for somebody to tell you what to do so that then you could execute it, we'll be sailing in 2025. It, everybody's got to pull their weight and join the fight here to get this, um, to get the program started holistically. The cruise lines cannot do it all. So uh, in Alaska, they took the position of, uh, the, the realities are that it's not just waiting for that. Cruise lines need to know well in advance whether they're gonna be allowed to come in and what capacities they can bring in. It might be that a protocol in a port might say, well, you know, we'll only use 50% of our berthing capacity. Well, you have to figure that out now because cruises in six months are already are already on the books and are being sold and are hopefully will sail. 
So uh, rather than uh, in Alaska, you have a unique situation. It's such a, a, a unique uh, limited number of environments that you can look together what is possible. So what they've asked us to do is to help them. They're going to be figuring out, but we're going to be coordinating what is what can they do, what is available, present it to the stakeholders, and then develop a plan that at least on several of the ports they can implement that will provide that assurance to the community that, that cruises can come in and that it can be executed as part of an overall plan. So it's like security. If you have a weak link anywhere in the chain, it breaks. So in this case, uh, these ports have to develop their, their standard or at least um, um, approaches that work with each other. Are other ports or regions in the world doing anything similar? As far as I know, there's a number of ports in the Caribbean that are trying to discuss this. I don't know how far they've gotten into it. Uh, the Caribbean is more difficult because there's so many more destinations. Um, so as far as I know, that's this is the only one, and it's just starting. And uh, they've been, uh, you know, forward thinking enough that uh, uh, that they uh, they want to do this collectively. So uh, that's the only one that I know. Is there a danger of a sort of patchwork of protocols developing that cruise operators have to adhere to different types of standards in different places? I don't think so, Anne, because today, let's take security as an example. There is a master set of guidelines or goals that are set by the ISP plan. But the actual execution at each port is governed by what that port does, how it does it, and so forth. So. Um, we got to come to the realization that there is no, um, right now there's no agency worldwide that's dictating this. The, the information you get from the World Health Organization is very generic, so you can't execute on that. Uh, in the United States, there is no mandate, and you heard Brian say that it might not even be coming from the CDC. Uh, public health agencies are not jumping into the picture to tell ports what the mandates might be. But I think that, so I think practically these regional approaches will work really well and one will learn from the other and figure out what works best. So uh, if Alaska is first and sets that, you know, so be it. But hopefully uh, other areas in the Mediterranean and the Baltic, North Sea and, uh, and uh, the Caribbean will, will follow suit. So, Lewis, how will cruise terminals have to adapt to allow for social distancing and all of the health screening that's going to take place? So, we've been really uh, thinking very hard and actually doing some simulations now with our simulator systems, um, recognizing that technology is evolving, the cruise lines are maintaining that discussion internally uh, of what they're going to do on the ship, what we're going to do on the land. Um, but, and we know that there's a series of steps that you can go from, you know, the top of the notch where everybody's tested before they walk up the ship to the more routine temperature screening uh, type of stuff. But what we did the other day is we took one of the terminals that we had just done and put social distancing on. And what happens is now the terminals will take literally, if you're going at full capacity, a ship could take literally six hours to disembark because you can't load up enough people to collect the luggage to move things around. So uh, an embark will be probably around four hours in this terminal that we were running. Every terminal is going to be different because every terminal has different space requirements and space and flows. But this is one of the state-of-the-art brand new terminals and that's what we see happening there. Um, obviously at 50 percent capacity, then things will look normal. But the minute that ramps, the, the ships ramp up to full capacity, literally the terminals will not work the way they work today. And that's without adding any steps to the process. So if there's a health screening step, if there's some other quarantine area, if there's some way of, um, of checking, an additional check process, uh, that's gonna slow it down. Then you have all the issue with baggage and all the issues with provisioning in the home ports, which have to be handled. And that I think is simpler because that's back a house and it's just putting equipment, the right equipment. But um, uh, so terminals, 
Um, right now, the, to my knowledge, none of them are being adapted other than to basically sanitize and clean up and, and put some queue lines. But other than that, uh, terminals really need uh, a, a really very strong review or the cruise lines will show up and at them, but very quickly they will be. So, Lewis, your company, BNA, are experts in planning and industrial engineering. Are you working with any service providers to develop an all-in-one or turnkey solution for ports? We we have been approached by um, uh, by Worldwide Services Group, um, and to help them and partner with them in looking at solu pro specific solutions and specific terminals in which they might have a contract. And I thought that was a very interesting proposal because they can expand on their existing service that they provide in with the security uh, and add the health screening services to that in terms of the passengers. Um, we think there's lots of room for a lot of equipment vendors and different providers. Um, and what we wanna do is make sure we have a platform that can adapt to each facility um, and to each situation. Are ports in a position to pay for all these changes? Well, they're, you know, the, the small, the smaller cruise ports, everybody's hurting. The cruise lines obviously are hurting. Any port that is heavily relying on cruise business uh, is is significantly impacted, and most of them have reduced or uh, restructured the capital program. So my guess is that most do not have that. But this is one of those features that, just like security, uh, in a lot of places, ports might not pay for the security equipment. That's a service that's provided and built into a into a price structure. Um, and we think there's a value proposition there because selling a healthy cruise experience to a customer has value. Uh, I certainly would pay more if I know that every person that's gone on a ship has either been tested or gone strenuously through a process that is at least better than anything else, whether it's a theme park or a hotel operator, just so that you know that you are competitively ahead of, of the um, in this industry. And um, I think I, I, I certainly would, I'm staying in a hotel right now, and uh, I would pay a lot more if they really enhance um, the, 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 what they offer here to f make me feel more comfortable when I'm, when I'm here. So thank you, Lewis. Um, Brian, Lewis covered a lot of areas, but would you have any quick reaction to some of the things you discussed? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Anne. Um, no, I think uh, Lewis is right on. Um, one of the challenges that uh, is facing us right now and helping you know, trying to develop protocols that we can communicate is you know, we still, particularly in the U.S., still have some time ahead of us. Uh, the technology uh, is somewhat elusive uh, because our understanding of the virus is continually changes. Uh, almost every week there's something new uh, about you know, vulnerable populations, about how it's transmitted, about what uh, is a good protective measure, and so forth. So if you were to ask me even a month ago, you know, what we saw in terms of, let's just say, screening, I'd probably give you a different answer than what I'd give you today. And a month from now, it might be different still, uh, because it is a moving target. Now, at some point, we're just going to have to put the stake in the sand and say this is what is you know, going to be done. Uh, but uh, at, while we have this time, uh, we're exploring you know, the technological options. It's a little bit different than a hotel. Uh, hotels mm -hmm. are continuing to operate. They still have guests. Uh, we do not. Uh, we do. You know, we don't have to. You know, fix the airplane while it's flying, if you will. We we have a little bit of time to uh, use the you know, identify the best procedures that will be available as of the time we're ready to resume operations. Now, again, that may happen in, in a staggered fashion. Uh, you know, depending on where we are in the world. But uh, that's generally the philosophy that's being followed uh, among the cruise lines right now. Yeah. Well. And, 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 and if I could add to that, I think, uh, I think the, ch the challenge has been that in other circumstances, a standard has been set. W what is it that you're shooting for? There is no standard set here. I think everybody understands that perfection is impossible in anything. 
Uh, the question is, what is that? What what are what are the cruise lines and the ex the entire experience shooting for? I basically for us we keep working that it's that the cruise lines have to be better best than any other um, travel and um, the hospitality experience. And if you did that, now you have the high ground uh, in to your customer, to the CDC, to the regulators, to your community that your standard is excess of everything else. What we're seeing right now, though, is everybody's really gravitating to the same standard. So whether you compare it to Walt Disney World or Universal Studios or hotels, uh, is what is that standard? And, and that's where I think we should all be shooting for. Um, and uh, I think that will, that will do wonders for the industry. Okay, hey, well, thank you very much. Now let's turn to Jurgen and hear what Rexila is doing to help the cruise industry get up and running. Jurgen? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, it seems we're in a stalemate with the CDC and others on uh, and building confidence that uh, the entire industry, we can do other than just sanitation. Um, Vertsala is a technology company. We, we would like to approach this uh, stalemate uh, with technology, if at all possible. We would like to approach the communi communicable disease problem the same way we uh, do with other problems on board. Uh, Louis, you mentioned the security screening. Uh, if we look at it as a fire, when you pr protect against fires on board ships, you have the prevent, detect, mitigate. Um, uh, with that, uh, the, the uh, uh, prevent and detect uh, mm -hmm. is much more now important than the mitigate. We do social distancing as if everybody was actually carrying. Uh, if we could guarantee against it, we could uh, then use the terminals and the spaces on board in a safer way. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, one of our concepts that we are uh, now uh, uh, creating is a check-in kiosk that is a health screening station. Uh, in, and in this um, uh, example, it would uh, uh, you would it would take your temperature, a photo. It would take your pulse and oxygen saturation level. Uh, this is totally uh, non-intrusive. The only thing you do is you touch with your finger to get your pulse and oxygen saturation. Uh, but it's not intrusive, it's fast, and you can actually have self-cleaning uh, of this station. So even if a carrier comes and touches, uh, 30 seconds later, it's safe for another person to, to touch it without a human intervention. And looking at the uh, security screening process that everybody is used to, to pass yet another station uh, where you, again, um, it's like a selfie kiosk for an airplane, you uh, process yourself through there, we could do mass testing of significant uh, uh, biodata enough to communicate this to um, the uh, medical software on board and normally Triton Seacare uh, uh, or, or, or similar products uh, fully encrypted. And if you do this at the terminal, you already know that everybody inside the terminal, be it shore worker or uh, a guest coming to board or crew coming to board or service technicians, you have the first screening. For uh, the ship itself, you put them at the station uh, just after the gangway. Uh, you can, if you have an outbreak condition, it doesn't have to be COVID, you can test up to every 12 hours of every guest, if you like, because of the tracking uh, that they identify themselves, we can have a demand that they check themselves every 12 hours along the cruise, which means we can catch the people that are going through their incubation time uh, or are almost asymptomatic uh, for a few days. So uh, with the simple kiosk, you, you really get the grasp of what's going on. And in the early concept, we would uh, only check these uh, four vitals, which is adequate for the demand set by the European CDC. Uh, we are also looking into other technologies such as uh, bio air sniffers, meaning checking mm -hmm. contactless your exhaled air for virus particles. Now there are uh, several emerging technologies for it and they are portable and 
uh, non-intrusive and simple enough to incorporate into a checking kiosk style uh, machine. Very interesting. Um, may I ask uh, for some quick reaction from Brian to the, this proposal, these proposals? Sure. Well, uh, I think it represents the kind of innovative thinking that the cruise industry is looking for. Um, it, it, for one thing, it addresses one of the big logistical problems that everybody's been wrestling with. How do you deal with large numbers of people in a screening scenario? So if we can do that more efficiently and effectively, uh, absolutely, that type of technology is welcome. And it's got to be part of the solution. Well, that's uh, pretty fascinating how Wertzela is reinventing itself to help the business. On, and we know that there are lots of other uh, suppliers on this call who are, who are interested in, in providing help and services as well. All very encouraging. It's always been a super innovative industry. And um, it's exciting to see what may come out of what's been a very terrible situation. So uh, we're coming up close to the end of our time now. And we want to allow some, uh, some time for questions and answers. So as a reminder to participate in the Q&A, please type your question into the text box that is located to the right of the presentation window, or click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And if we're not able to answer all your questions today, we'll be sure to share them with our speakers so they can answer offline, because we are getting a little bit close on time this morning. I apologize for that. Now, I'm going to start with a few questions that were submitted during the registration process. And here is the first one. Um, I think this is going to be for you, Brian. When cruises resume, what will the CDC's stance be if there's an outbreak? Is there any way to be sure the ship would not be put into quarantine? Uh, that's a really excellent question. And I would say, um... Uh, that's one of the, the aspects of our resumption planning that is getting a lot of attention. Uh, what we would anticipate is that the current requirements that CDC has have imposed for crew uh, would also carry forward, as I mentioned. And part of that is isolation and quarantine measures. Uh, there's a lot of thought being put into how that would be managed uh, with passengers on board. Uh, again, you would have, you know, for example, you might dedicate you know, a certain portion of the ship for quarantine and isolation measures, uh, isolate, uh, quarantine measures. Um, maybe have an, uh, additional uh, medical staff on board to help manage that. Uh, very strict protocols for interactions with people who are affected. And that all of this um, with the view towards enhancing the capabilities to deal with uh, symptomatic persons um, and keep them isolated from, you know, un, you know, from healthy uh, crew and passengers. The goal is to build up enough confidence with CDC and health authorities wherever we operate that it does not result in the entire ship um, being subject to to local, you know, health authority controls. We want to be able to continue operations uh, to the maximum extent possible. Now, the thinking is also, you know, if you have a few isolated cases, that should be very manageable. Uh, if it reaches a point where a person needs to be evacuated to a shoreside facility, cruise lines are thinking about how best to do that in ways that were never really much of a concern before, uh, but need to be considered in this new environment. So commercial resources uh, would be you know, having the ability to do that are, are very much under consideration. We don't want ships being denied entry, and we don't want them being quarantined. We know that that, that is very um, uh, it makes it more difficult to, to resume. Uh, so we have to build up enough confidence in our procedures so that we can, we can maintain operations, even if a, a person with symptoms, you know, does present himself. Okay. Thank you. And we have a question here about crewing. 
crewing up, will it be a challenge or not? With 50 ships in U.S. waters and only one so far having met the criteria to be able to repatriate crew on commercial transport, how are you going to get everyone home and back? And will crew even want these jobs after all they've been through? Well, uh, no, excellent question. Uh, part of the challenge with repatriating crew right now, uh, aside from the CDC requirements, which are very restrictive in terms of the use of commercial uh, transportation means, including you know airports and even air terminals, um, has been that many countries will not um, allow people to enter, even their own citizens. Uh, we've had a number of countries where we're trying to repatriate citizen crew members, and that has been closed off to them. So their only option has been to remain on board. Uh, how will this be different in the future? Well, as travel restrictions are eased and the world starts getting back to normal, you know, those travel barriers would be removed. Um, we also know that, you know, many of our crew members, you know, they kind of goes back to where we started. They want to be treated with dignity and respect. They want the, the international rules, the Maritime Labor Convention, the Seafarers Bill of Rights to be adhered to. And that's you know not only by companies, but by countries. Um, with all of that, if it's back in place and people have freedom of movement, it should be a lot easier to get people back than it was to get them home. Um, our you know, our expectation, too, is that, you know, many of our crew members, I mean, this is their livelihood. Um, they they want to work and, you know, we want to have them working. Uh, so we think that, uh, you know, once uh, travel restrictions are eased, that will be much easier to accomplish. Okay. Thank you. We have several questions related to air quality on cruise ships, and Jurgen, you mentioned uh, this as well in, in your remarks. Since COVID-19 is an airborne disease, what are lines doing to improve their ventilation systems so that the virus is prohibited from spreading from cabin to cabin? Um, is that for me then? Um... Having been experienced uh, being at sea myself, I can probably say what what they all do. Uh, normally, for for um, uh, to save on air conditioning, you re recirculate the air uh, up to sixty percent, seventy percent. In a COVID situation, the first part is that you're always taking only one hundred percent fresh air from the outside. Uh, you can even sew uh, in in the safe confinement of an air treatment unit. You can use the ultraviolet light uh, UVC that will also sterilize uh, anything incoming from outside air should it be uh, drawn from, for example, uh, upper sun deck and there would be a, a person with infection there, uh, you would sterilize it with the UVC. And they are uh, safe to use in, a, in the confinement of the air treatment unit where none of the slightly harmful uh, ultraviolet light can, can, can leave out before it uh, passes the air. So uh, that these are the two obvious ones, and I, I, I am aware that most of the cruise liners are already considering the retrofitting of the UVC light, and the first step was for all of them to go to 100% recirculation. Or, sorry, 100% fresh air. Okay. Uh, we have several questions here about changes in ship design and new building. Um, will there be any big changes in the kind of ships being built in the future? Who would like to take that one? Well, I'd say I, I am not uh, aware of any anything definitive along those lines. Um, I'm sure people are uh, considering, you know, what the future might look like in terms of future ship designs. Um, but I think it, at this stage, it would be premature to say, you know, what that might look like. Okay. And uh, then related to that, there's a question about if changes will be needed in expedition vessel new building design, uh, referring to social distancing inside the vessels and the distribution of public spaces. Is that one for me? Um, I, I, would, I would say, you know, a lot of the same considerations that we've talked about, social distancing, um, even, you know, ventilation systems, I think would apply regardless of the size of ship. Because obviously, the, 
the the options change, you know, as uh, you look at different ship configurations and different ship sizes, and even you know the numbers of people that are on board the ship. But uh, at some overarching level, um, they have to be factored into the to the protocols that individual lines would would follow. Okay. Um. Here's a question about the media's role. Media have played a negative part causing widespread wrong perception about health control measures on board cruise ships. Does the industry need a much stronger voice to counter these misleading reports? I think that's for you again, Brian. Uh, well, yes, and we've done a lot of deep thinking about how to get out our message. Um, I think we we suffered initially because you know, unlike other industries, um, we have a reporting requirement. We report whenever people are become ill, um, and we report that to health authorities. You don't see that same reporting requirement, say for air travel or from hotels and so forth. So right away, that brought a spotlight on us, uh, unfairly, I believe, but uh, but but that's what happened. So absolutely, uh, we are um, in the process of putting together messages and outreach engagement to to send the proper message. Uh, we are a responsible industry. We have a very strong track record of taking care of people um, and and ensuring that you know to the to the extent we can and that it's humanly possible that our guests um, have the safest and healthiest environment. Um, that it's possible for us to provide. So we we will be going out with uh, additional messaging uh, along those lines. Okay, uh, here's a question from a tour operator. When cruising resumes, will lines allow guests to go onshore independently or only if they have a shore excursion organized by the cruise line? L Lewis, would you take that one? Well, I line I assume will we'll, uh, we'll make those decisions. Uh, based on the risk profile and the and the and what they do once a passenger comes back on board, so if you have a robust check environment coming on board, then you can do a lot more things. But I think that's where the value proposition goes. That if um, if the the folks that are offering uh, the services, the tours, uh, the different experiences on land, if they can develop the protocols that exceeds anybody else's protocol. Um, then that's going to be a value proposition they can sell to a customer. If a customer knows that they take Tour A and that has gone through a certain level of assurance, a uh, certain level of testing, certain level of, of, of rigorous uh, design, where the other one might not be, I think that will become the differentiator. How the cruise line uses that to differentiate with the customer, I can't say. But I, I think that that's, if I'm running a tour operation, that's certainly where I would go. Um, and offer that as a as a very strong value proposition. Okay, well, I'm sorry to say that we've run to the end of our time. There are many more questions waiting, but as I as I mentioned earlier, we'll get those to the speakers uh, in the hope that they can respond to you individually. Um, thank you, Lewis, Brian, and Jurgen. We appreciate your time and expertise on today's topic. And thanks to everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attendance and participation. Within the next 24 hours, you will be receiving a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Feel free to share that with any of your colleagues who may have not been able to join us today. This webinar is copyright 2020 by Informa Markets. The presentation materials are owned or copyrighted by Sea Trade Crews. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. On behalf of our guests, Louis Ahamil, Brian Salerno, and Jurgen Strandberg, I'm Ann Kalosh. Thanks for your time and have a great day.